Hi, and welcome to episode seven of Understanding Darktable. In the last video, we looked at the Select module. Now we're gonna look at the Selected Images module. The first two buttons here at the top of these two columns, Remove and Trash. It's important to know the difference between these. Remove will simply remove an image or a group of images, if you have multiple images selected, from Darktable and from the database but it will not remove the asset from your hard drive or your memory card. Trash, on the other hand, does exactly that. It will, depending on your system preferences, either move those images to the recycle bin, slash trash can, slash trash, whatever you want to call it, or delete it permanently, which means it won't be recoverable. So if I wanted to grab these five images I shot in my garden last week. Click on remove. We can now go to the photos drive and we can see from the test shots folder that those images are still there. They're just no longer in the database. And if I wanted to bring them back, I could just import that folder again, like so, and there they are back. But if I was to click trash, let's just take that last one of the jade. We'll click trash. Darktable does ask for confirmation. Are you absolutely sure that this file is going bye bye? It ain't coming back. We click yes. And then we jump back over to this folder and we can see that that image has been deleted. And there are now only four images in that folder. The next one is move. And this will give us the option to physically move the file on hard disk from its current location to whatever location we want to specify. So I might say, move this to my pictures folder, select that as a destination. It says, do you really want to physically move that one selected image to home Bruce pictures? If I click yes, go to the pictures folder and there it is there, along with its sidecar file. So now I could move that image back to where it was by simply selecting it, click move again, go photos drive, photos, test shots, 2018, 0705, I should have just selected the folder, select as destination, yes I want to move it, and now it's back with its friends. The next option is copy. Again, same deal. Whatever images you've got selected, rather than moving them from their current location, you can copy them to another location. So they'll still exist where they currently live, but they'll also exist in a new location. This could be used as a backup routine. Let's say you went out, you did a shoot, it was a personal project, you shot 100 images, you've come home, you've imported all of your images, and you've worked on the ones that you like, and let's say you ended up with 10 shots that you really liked, and you thought to yourself, I want to keep those 10 shots backed up, uh, but I don't want the other 90. So what you could do is select those 10 images, plug in an external hard drive, click on copy, select the destination, and what will get backed up to that drive is then not only the images that you wanted to keep, but it's the images you wanted to keep with all the processing you've already done. So rather than just backing up the images the minute you got home, you've actually worked on them, done whatever you wanted to do to polish them up, and then you back them up using the copy function. The next one is create HDR. Ideally, to do this properly, you would work with a bracketed set of exposures. So if I go to my collect images, I'll go tag, I'll go HDR, and what I do is the images that I've shot with an anticipation that later on I'm going to use them to create HDR images, I tag with HDR source, meaning these are source files from which I will build an HDR image. So I could just double click on that, there we go, there's four images there that I shot in France last year. So what I could do there is go select those four images, click on create HDR, we can see down here merging four images and wrote merged HDR 6569-HDR.DNG. Now sadly 
because I'm looking at this tag collection of images with HDR source, we're not seeing the image that just got created. So if we want to see that, I'm going to have to go to the folder where these images live. So I would go image information 2017-06-20. So I'm going to have to go import an image from my family photos 2017-06-20. And there it is right there. Click on open. And there is our DNG file. We can see from the thumbnail, it's got DNG behind it as the file extension. And I'm not going to go into the whole processing of HDR right now because that's a subject for a whole separate video. But there's your HDR file ready to work on. And what you will find when you go to process it is you've got much more dynamic range to play with than you would simply from a single image. So let's jump back to our test images. The next option is duplicate. Now for anyone who's worked in Adobe Lightroom, this is the same as creating a virtual copy. Essentially what it does is allow you to create a second XMP sidecar file for one original raw image or raw file. So if I pick, well let's say this square image of the oil burner in my backyard. If I click on duplicate, I've now got these two thumbnails in the grid view, both referencing the same raw file on disk, but I can process them separately. And if we come over to our folder, we can see that there are now two XMP sidecar files for this image. So there's the original 0970.arw, but now there's 0970-01.arw.xmp. So what we can do is we can have one version that's color, and I might go to the second one and go, let's make this monochrome. So I'll go over here, click on monochrome, jump back to the light table view, and you can see there that we've now got two different processing versions of the same raw file. The beauty of this is that you can experiment with different methods of processing an image without having to physically duplicate the raw data on disk. My raw files are around about 40 megabytes each, which, okay, in today's money, it's not that expensive to store multiple copies, but why bother? When you can just store multiple versions of the XMP file, which are only a couple of kilobytes, and just reference the same original raw file. It's like when you had negatives with film. You could process that negative as many different ways as you like, and that's exactly what this duplicate button does. It gives you the option to process multiple versions of the original raw file. Next, we've got these two buttons with the circular arrows. They simply allow you to rotate the image any way you see fit. So if I decided I wanted this image to be upside down, I could click either of these buttons twice, and now it's upside down, and if I rendered the image, it would come out that way as well. Next to that is Reset Rotation. That button will read the rotation as written into the EXIF metadata by the camera. So if the camera determined that it was in portrait orientation at the time the image was taken, then there will be EXIF metadata to reflect that. And so clicking the reset rotation button will reorient the image to a portrait orientation, regardless of how you may have otherwise set it. Next up, we've got copy locally and resync local copy. I actually think these two warrant a video of their own, so I'm gonna skip over them for now, and I will come back to those in, if not the next video, then the one after that. Next up, we've got the option to group images together. If I thought that maybe these six images here all belonged together, I could select all of them and then click the group button. As you can see from the tooltip, add selected images to an expanded group or create a new group. And you can use Control G to create that group as well. 
Now, when I mouse over any one of those images, you will see that there is a yellow bounding box around all six images to let us know that those six images have all been grouped together. Obviously, if I want to ungroup them, I would select all of those images again and click ungroup. Now, I can mouse over those images and you'll see there is no yellow bounding box around them anymore. If we select all of those images again and we group them, and I then just choose two images to ungroup, we can now see that the remaining four images are still grouped together, but these two images are no longer part of that group. Okay, that'll do it for this video. In the next one, we will look at copy locally and resync local copy and see just what they do. Talk to you then.